does everybody have a fair chance to hear or believe the gospel? This is obviously a very difficult and nerve-wracking question that a lot of people struggle with. And um, I do wonder if some Free Will Freddies would feel a bit more comfortable with election if it weren't for this very discomforting question. That is perhaps the the biggest objection to um, the non-free will interpretations of predestination, you know, if it's not interpreted through the free will lens. Now, one of the classic examples they will use to illustrate their objections to the chosen Charlies is that of the tribesman who has never heard of Jesus. So you think about, you know, these Amazonian tribes or people in Papua New Guinea uh, that have never had any or very little contact with the outside world. And even where they have had contact with the outside world, like the Inuits or the Polynesians and so on, they've only had contact in the last two to three hundred years. And so where was the gospel available to them in the first few hundred or thousand years? Now, because a lot of people can't cope with this question, they often make certain narratives, maybe to try and quieten their conscience, really. So they'll, they'll say things like, if somebody dies without having a chance to hear the gospel, they automatically go to heaven. But then, of course, you just think, well, why would you preach the gospel at all? It would be far better to hide the gospel and let the Christian religion die out if that were the case. So various free will, free graces try to come at it in a different way and, and suggest that somehow in some way the gospel message, even to a limited degree, does somehow go out to every single person before they die, even in the most remote tribes and places with a high mortality rate where people could die at a very young age. And I think the problem with that rather rose-tinted view of the world is that while we don't know the full extent of how far the correct gospel has reached, most of recorded history prior to the printing press was very difficult to preserve. We don't have any written history of these tribes, or only oral history, which does not necessarily include the tales of great news bearers. Okay, But we do have extensive recorded his, uh, histories of a East Asian cultures, such as India, China, Japan. Um, and that includes extensive religious and philosophical literature. Yet Christianity is largely absent from their records, even from the perspective of a foreign oddity or strange cultural, uh, countercultural idea, and even where some Christianity had some recorded influence, like um, I suppose Nestorianism in the Mongol Empire, it either died out or it had a very limited impact on culture. And for all we know, in more cases than not, it was probably a false gospel that was being propagated anyway. But Christian ideas did spread via trade and so on, but that does depend on how much communication went out that way and how much discourse traders would exchange with each other on the topic of religion. So ultimately, we don't know down to every last individual how much the gospel did spread or whether these places had any reach whatsoever. Now, the problem that I have with this rose-tinted view about the gospel reaching out to every individual is that I suspect the people who profess it don't really believe that. Now, don't get offended at what I'm saying here. I'm not, I'm not trying to have any jabs at anybody, but if we go back to the tribesman example, okay, and you say that your biggest problem with God choosing people for salvation is that these tribesmen who have never heard of Jesus were chosen by God for destruction, or, or you could just say not chosen for salvation and, and therefore forced into destruction. Well, I guess my question to you is, why does that question matter or even apply if you believe that everybody has a fair chance to believe the gospel? Because it doesn't matter, does it? If, if, if the only way the question matters is if deep down you know that not everybody has had a fair chance to hear of Jesus. And so we go back to the original question, don't we? Now, 
when people realise that, they, they get very angry at God's election because they think that God is hiding the, the gospel from these tribesmen deliberately just to make them go to hell just because. So they have to stick free will in there to flip it on the tribesmen to make it his fault that he's never heard of or, or didn't know he could believe the gospel. Now, me personally, I'm, I'm sure somebody in the comments will explain this to me, but I cannot for the life of me, if, if my life depended on it, I cannot understand how free will solves that problem. Do, does free will somehow change the fact that the tribesmen never had a chance to hear the gospel and believe on Jesus? Does God looking through the corridors of time and seeing free will decisions somehow re somehow cause missionaries to suddenly make the free will choice to try harder and get the gospel to those people in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century, when the whole world was not mapped yet? Well, no, it doesn't, does it? And so to attribute free will to the purposes of election and predestination is really to say that God uh, sat back, really, with his arms folded, knowing that there's all these people who could be saved if they just had a fair chance to believe, and God wants them to be saved, but all of these missionaries are thousands of miles away, and the steam engine hasn't been invented yet, and we don't know how big this planet is yet, but God just sat back allowing it to happen. Okay. And he could have even given the entire tribe a road to Damascus experience that they could passed down in their oral tradition um, that we could then discover these already Christian tribes out there but for some reason he didn't do that for whatever mysterious reason. Now I'm sure I've already driven a couple of subscribers away at this point but for those of you still listening let me explain to you why God's foreknowledge and predestination fixes this entire problem. Okay now even if as a free will, Freddy, you believe that foreknowledge is basically just God knowing in advance who will be saved. And I assume that you also believe that almighty God is capable of knowing who could be saved, hypothetically, right? You know, if they were given a, a fair chance to hear the gospel, God knows whether they would have believed it or rejected it, right? He just has that foreknowledge to, to understand the outcome of every choice. Okay, Let, let's just suppose that, that you also agree with that, I'm, I'm assuming. Now, there are missionaries who have tried to give the gospel to these isolated tribes, but they were killed, okay? And obviously God knew that that would happen ahead of the event, right? God, the, the missionary didn't know it, but God already knew that that would happen. So if a tribe has never heard of Jesus, God ultimately knows if a missionary could have hypothetically successfully gotten the gospel to those guys and gotten them saved or not. Now consider this also, by being born in a modern, moderately free country with access to the internet and a leather bound book, you know, Bible, Genesis to Revelation, bound at the spine, you know, all bounded together, you have to realise and you have to come to terms with the fact that you have essentially won a postcode lottery and a chronological lottery because you could have just as easily been born on Easter Island 800 years ago and a person from that place and time could have been born in your body in, and had your experiences today. Okay, so if God is able to foreknow who will and won't be saved, well, would you not also be able to reason that he is able to ensure that the souls of his potential elect, the people who could be saved if given the chance, will be born in a time and place where they will get to hear the gospel fairly? I mean, isn't that a fair question? Now, we know that from Scripture that God is not a respecter of persons and that the children of God are not born according to the will of the flesh. So God does not have some special favour for people of Jewish ancestry or, or whatever. Okay. Now, given that in the Old Testament, the gospel, or you might say um, the oracles of God, were primarily confined to the nation of Israel or Judah, obviously the vast majority of believers would have been Jewish. And despite their constant idolatry and sin, uh, 
he had mercy on the nation for his namesake. Otherwise, the, the grace of salvation, his namesake, could die out. Now, when we fast forward to Jesus' time, the Jewish diaspora was a bit more spread out. So there, there were many, many Jews as well who rejected Christ. But there were also multitudes of people who believed, mainly concentrated in Judea. But then the apostles, particularly Paul, would go on to spread the gospel around Europe and Asia Minor. So there was always a righteous remnant, and they were they did spread wherever the gospel could be reached, where, wherever they were, but they were also con concentrated enough that fellow believers could find fellowship with one another. Now, we on the other hand, we have the internet, but then the flip side is that people wouldn't be subjected to such a wide variety of satanic ideas that would draw their souls away. Now, with modern communication and scientific knowledge and so on, there is a, a wider variety of ideas which draw people away from God. And it, and it seems as well like it's harder to find brethren that live where we are. You know, we're, people on my channel, you're all quite dispersed, even people that are in the UK don't live in my city for instance so it seems like it's harder to find our fellow brethren now whereas you know in the New Testament they had brethren in their general area but they also didn't have the internet to reach out to people in faraway places so but but knowledge of the gospel also it, it still goes out very widely in our day and age as well so our fellow brethren they are still out there just like they were out there in Paul's time and Jesus time they just spread a bit more far and wide geographically than perhaps they were in that time. Now you might be thinking that none of this answers the original question um, or, you know, of the tribesman who's never heard of Jesus. Well, I think about the problem with the, I think the problem with this question is that, again, people have this rose-tinted view of how this all functions. I think people are imagining that these tribesmen are out there with a Jonah or Nineveh type of story where people are fasting and praying and crying out to the sky that a true God would come and speak to them and reach them but they just don't know what it is or who he is or, or, you know they, they really want it but they just don't know what it is or where it is but we can observe in our modern well-connected culture and throughout history and throughout Genesis that man's heart is constantly drawn away from God now you have the access to the internet you know what the gospel is if you're a regular viewer i assume you have access to all of this material out there of people refuting this and that like myself and others out there dealing with this issue and that issue well look around you what does everybody around you believe they believe in roman catholicism nonsense they believe in lordship salvation they believe mormonism they're scientologists they believe that organic matter organized itself into complex life forms they believe in feminism they believe in humanism they believe in new age witchcraft okay we we see this pattern in the bible after the flood they all build the tower of babel and the language was scattered and you fast forward a few, few hundred years later abraham's the only one carrying the true religion because all of these other nations are completely pagan and all invented their own gods and fables and then israel was the only nation carrying the oracles of god because every other nation is heathen mankind it doesn't matter how much information you do give him he's drawn towards strange gods and strange ideas even when he started out with the truth to begin with and he persecutes those who try to give him the truth so let's consider some examples jesus told us of how the israelites would kill the prophets japan is a country which uh, recorded history tells us Christianity had no presence until the last few hundred years but if you read Shinto creation myth it does actually have some striking similarities to Genesis in the Bible um, and it talks about heaven and earth coming out of the void and the three deities and uh, you know if you think of Elohim the plural for God Father Son and Holy Spirit let us make man in our image and, and they believe in the three deities so somehow we've moved from the Genesis story of, of God making the earth to all of these demons and weird stories of the heavens in Shintoism. And 
throughout history, the Roman Catholic Church persecuted Christians outside of the church. And it, it wasn't because they were so powerful that it just had an all-seeing eye that every time somebody believed the gospel, it just relied on, you know, it just got them and found them. On the contrary, that religion relied on ordinary people like you and me snitching on other believers and reporting them to the authorities and labelling them as heretics, okay? They weren't just this supernatural entity. There were ordinary Christians like you and me, but they were just grassing, you know, on the, the other Christians to the authorities, and that, that's how they were able to maintain that power. And so my point is, really, that even when people who have heard the gospel and have heard of Jesus and have a fair chance to, to hear, they are still, by and large, drawn to their false gospel and their false gods and their politicians and philosophies of this world and their condemnation is greater because they have no excuse now i mean the tribesman at least has an excuse for not hearing about jesus what's the excuse for all these pagans in the society that we live in you know and so these tribes that haven't heard of jesus and the prophets well the, the bible tells us they they perished without the law so they will be judged without the law. You know, they can't necessarily be judged by our standard, but they can be judged by a standard. You know, why did they kill the missionaries when somebody tried to give them the gospel? Why did they cannibalize and kill other tribes for their own benefit? What if God already knew that they would have rejected the gospel if they would have heard it anyway, and then they would now be under more condemnation had they heard the gospel than if they hadn't heard the gospel and they would be under less condemnation, right? So you need to realise that when you're giving the gospel, you're not just giving the good news that brings salvation to the remnant. You are also bringing condemnation to the workers of iniquity who will reject the message that you're coming with. And even the Bible tells us that some people, um, like Judas, I think it is, would have been better off if they hadn't have known God. Okay. And so I know a lot, I know this has been a long winded explanation, and I haven't used a lot of scriptural arguments, which is normally what I would do on this channel. But the, the problem is with this subject is that it becomes very emotionally charged, and people are in danger of elevating their feelings above the scripture, which is why I've taken a different approach to this series. But I, I'm trying to get you to realize that predestination and election is not some distasteful doctrine of a malicious, capricious God, but rather God, knowing all of the satanic deceptions that will hit the world, and knowing all the persecution that the saints are going to face, and knowing the hard-heartedness of man, he will position the souls of the elect into a time and place where they will get to hear the gospel, okay, in their lifetime. And so you say, why... Why preach the gospel if God already foreknows? Because if we have faith that there's a field ripe for harvest, we have faith that God will bring his elected believers to where we are so then we can have fellowship with them and our brothers and sisters, you know, are out there. So we're, we're going out to try and find them. That's what we're doing. And on to those who haven't heard the gospel, we pray that God will open up that avenue. But woe well, on to those who we do reach and they reject the gospel anyway. And so tying this in with my discourse on how there's none that seeks after God, why is it that these missionaries need to go out to these places? Because they're not going out looking for it themselves, okay? Now, I'm I'm not for one second suggesting that European coloni colonialism was righteous. Obviously, it was driven largely by wickedness and rich people and greed, you know, to accumulate more riches. But missionaries were able to piggyback off of that, uh, you know, going on. But here's the problem. Nobody else was sailing around the world, passing knowledge and enabling the Bible to circulate. Nobody in Asia or the Pacific was going to do it. The Native Americans weren't sailing around the world to discover it and catalogue all these new cultures and religions. Japan was completely isolated from the rest of the world. And even today, we have places where it's still very difficult for the gospel to reach, like North Korea, for instance, because they've shut themselves off. But here's what you need to realise about a place like North Korea. Communism didn't just fall down from the sky and suddenly force an entire country of involuntary participants or, or involuntary people to, to be forced into it. Okay, It relied on ordinary people like you and me 
fighting for it and supporting it and being deceived by it. And when that happened, loads of Christians actually fled to South Korea. So either all of these Christians were smart enough to prophesy about what's coming, or it was so obvious what would have happened under communism that it didn't take a genius to figure out that the Christians need to get out of that place. Okay, but that's because all those other people who weren't Christian were being duped by it. Okay, because again, communism isn't some all-seeing eye that can catch everybody in anything. It relies on ordinary people like you and me snitching on the guy who had a Bible in his house and reporting him to the authorities. Uh, so you need to understand that, you know, they're not all just victims who want the truth but haven't got access to it. It's more complicated than that. So there's a lot more I could say on this, but, uh, you know, I have to talk more in some videos. But my overall point is that men love darkness rather than light, and that's why the light has to go out and find him, and that's why the gospel has to be preached, not just looked for. But God does know who the elect are. He does know who the predestined are. And even under the free will model, if he foresees everything that's going to happen, then he knows who will get to hear the gospel. So he knows that if, if somebody potentially could believe the gospel, if they had a fair chance, well, then all he has to do is put the soul of that person in a time and place where they're going to get to hear it. It's as simple as that. So predestination is not, or election, it's not the enemy of this concept. Okay, it's God making sure that people who can be saved will be saved and he'll get to make sure that they hear the gospel and anybody who hears the gospel and won't be saved well all the more woe unto them than if they hadn't heard it 